The Reconstructionist Radio Podcast Network presents The X-Wing with your host, Joe Salant. Yeah, this is the broadcast for the rebels who have escaped from the collectivist orb. We got that pure justice on deck, but you got to come and get it. What's up? It's your boy, Joe Salant, repping the X-Wing, not right wing, not left wing, but X-Wing, smashing up on the idols on both sides of the aisle, all of them, with zero regard to whichever collective you may cling to. So, the NFL just settled its collusion case with Colin Kaepernick and his bud, X-Niner safety Eric Reed. And while the sources declined to offer specifics for the amount of bread involved, those in the know understand it must have been a pretty hefty sum. Uh, collusion is notoriously difficult to prove, and so this decision by the NFL to give up the cheese to make this go away means there was something obvious there with the owners conspiring together in some way to blackball Kaepernick and Reed, or something super damning that the owners didn't want in the news cycle. Now, I'll play this down the middle for y'all. At, at the time this started, uh, Cap doing the kneel downs during the flag song and all that, uh, he was no longer a quality NFL starting quarterback. So, you know, both him and Robert Griffith, the, Robert Griffith the third, ah, uh, shoot. Griffin the third. What's good, y'all? It's your boy Joe Salant, repping the X-Wing, not right wing, not left wing, but X-Wing, smashing up on all of the idols on both sides of the aisle. So, look, the NFL settled its collusion case with Colin Kaepernick and his bud, uh, X-Niner safety Eric Reed. And while the sources declined to offer specifics for the amount of bread that was involved, those in the know understand it was probably a hefty bag. Uh, conclusion, collusion is notoriously very difficult to prove. And so this decision by the NFL to give up the cheese to make this go away uh, means there was something obvious there with the owners conspiring in back rooms together to blackball Kaepernick and Reed or something super damning that the owners didn't want in the news cycle. So I'll play this down the middle for y'all. At the time this started, uh, with Cap doing the kneel downs during the flag song, he was no longer a quality NFL starting quarterback. Both him and RG3 of the Redskins lit it up as rookies, but defenses caught on pretty quick on both of the big, uh, both of the uh, fast, big arm quarterbacks. They they had a lot of trouble going through secondary reads, so defenses would just put a defensive, extra defensive back at the line of scrimmage to spy the quarterback run, and they'd use disguise coverages. So, uh, however, where uh, RG3 uh, got cut from the Redskins and found several jobs as a backup, you know, this last season with the Ravens after really stinking up the joint for the Browns in 2016, heading into that season as the starting quarterback, Cap has not seen the field since 2016 uh, after kneeling for the National Loyalty Song uh, with the 49ers that year. So he openly campaigned, Cap did for jobs, got zero offers, and on the eye test alone, I know Ball, he's better than RG3, and uh, certainly a good enough backup quarterback to get the contract, and if he could do a little better, you know, reading the defense and stuff like that, who knows, but but he didn't get a contract, his boy Reed, Eric Reed, a uh, hard-hitting safety, had, had trouble getting another deal after the Niners, but he is playing now, he is playing now, so anyway, that sets the stage, so why couldn't Cap get a job, what did he do? 
Well, in 2016, it took three games for the media to even notice that Cap was sitting during the national anthem. They asked him about it, and he said it was to draw attention to cops killing blacks in America, which is a serious issue. There is one black person killed by cops to two white persons that are killed by cops, right? But there's a five-to-one ratio of whites to black in the nation, uh, which means that blacks are 2.5 times more likely to be murdered by cops than whites. So this was the season following the Philando Castile murder. Cops executed that black dude in front of his family in his car, and the cop who pulled the trigger received a 50000 severance pay, bag of 50000 cash, instead of a prison cell. So Cap wanted to use whatever stage he had uh, to bring national attention, so he started sitting during the national song before the football game. Uh, media picked it up, and at the suggestion of a military veteran who somehow got to Cap, uh, Cap started to kneel instead of sit, and that was a gesture of respect uh, for the military, a compromise on his behalf. So, yeah, I don't want to disrespect the military, uh, but I need to get this point across, so I guess instead of sitting, I'll kneel. Uh, you know, and he said, to, to me, this is bigger than football, and the quote is, it would be selfish on my part to look the other way. Uh, other players around the league began to join in the protest, and it was on and cracking. So the rest is history. Everyone knows what's up. Summarizing the uh, anti-Kaepernick sentiment uh, that was apparently uh, effusive enough, prevalent enough in the back room with the owners to make them want to, want to settle out of court, didn't want it in the news cycle. Uh, you know, Donald Trump said in 2017 to a pretty much all-white crowd in Alabama, "This is this is Trump." Uh, speaking, President of the United States, uh, wouldn't you love to see one of those NFL owners when someone disrespects our flag to say, get that son of a bitch off the field right now, out, he's fired, he's fired. And the crowd just roared in approval to those words from Trump, and it looks like that's what the NFL owners uh, did. So Kaepernick committed the cardinal sin, you know. When the state is God... Here's the ethical judicial behind it. When the state is God, you don't uh, upstage the sacraments of the state religion with your cries for justice. You need to save that stuff for alternative venues, such as music lyrics or statements with clothing, stuff like that. If you're a football player, maybe like, uh, you know, a hashtag in your eye black, all that stuff is okay. Um, you know, but you do not, not. Touch the idols of those that worship the state. The Pledge of Allegiance is out of bounds. The National Anthem, definitely out of bounds. And uh, those are the sacraments of the Holy Collective, part of the worship of the state, which stifles justice by demanding the very sacrifice of the marginalized groups, such as black men, uh, you know, where are the fathers, all this other kind of stuff, right, you know, for, for the collective good. You know, the state has always demanded human sacrifice. The old pagan god Moloch mentioned in the Old Testament for the brutal practice of child sacrifice Israel was uh, condemned for participating in uh, simply means king, a king state. Uh, Moloch, the king collective, it, it's the feeding of the weaker vessel into the fire for the benefit of the collective. It's the, it's the ancient version, the version from antiquity of ask not what your country can do for you, but what you can do for your country. The collective over the individuals and the marginalized, the expendable, targeted for the fire to fuel the flame. Uh, dehumanize a segment and use them for as an engine for progress. Yesterday's slaves are today's criminals in the drug war for $300 a head in the prison industrial complex. Uh, you know, for a bunch of collectivists, you dare not draw attention to their injustices, especially by using their rituals as a microphone to demand justice. Heck no, you can't do that. That is what pissed the owner, pissed off the NFL owners. That is what pissed off Donald Trump. And Cap was not good enough on the field to overcome that. Uh, he probably would have had to been a, you know, a top ten, top eight quarterback at the time to overlook that offense against the great collective. At this point, he was not. So bam. Uh, but let's take a look even further at what lurks beneath the surface here to see the depth of the uh, state worship and injustice wrapped up not just in the reaction to Cap, uh, who, who like, okay, who, who by no means is a model of justice in every area of life, okay? We, un we understand that. But, you know, 
the fact that that needs pointing out is absurd. But, you know, not just in the reaction to Cap, uh, not just in the blind eye to cops shooting blacks contrasted with the hypocritical death stare at the black football player who dared kneel in respect of protest when the sound of the national worship song began to play, but in the very song, in the very anthem itself. I want you, I want you to take a look at this. All right. This song, this anthem, all right, the author, the author of this anthem is named Francis Scott Key. All right. He's basic. He, he, he was it in all, you know, in all in every essence of the of the idiom, like a Hitler to blacks in America. He was a very, very wealthy slave holding bigot in the 1800s. He was the district district attorney for the District of Columbia, a very good friend, a very key advisor to slave holding President Andrew Jackson. Anyone who know and if anyone knows who Roger Taney is. Uh, that's the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court who authored the Supreme Court opinion that blacks were property in the 1857 Dred Scott decision. Uh, Roger Taney, uh, he wrote the opinion. Disgusting. The reason Taney was on the court, he was Key's brother-in-law. Francis Scott Key, the author of the National Anthem's brother-in-law, was Roger Taney, the one who wrote that Dred Scott decision, and the reason why he was on the court was that Key called in a favor with his bud, Andrew Jackson. So as DA of D.C., uh, Francis Scott Key made black lives a living hell. He persecuted abolitionists who sought to end slavery. Uh, this from Joel McDermott's uh, The Problem of Slavery in Christian America. This is a mandatory volume for your bookshelf. This is, uh, this is from this book right here, uh, The Problem of Slavery in Christian America. Uh, let me bring it up real quick on my feed. Uh, in an 1833 case, for example, a group of free blacks assembled uh, for a party carefully applying f after carefully applying, paying for, and receiving the required permit. You know, despite the complaint after the party had well ensued, around 11 p.m., a group of Keys constables surrounded the building with guns, pistols, and clubs. They closed in and proceeded to rob the victims of all of their money and their watches. Around the same time, a constable at attempted to nab a black woman while crossing a bridge. In her attempt to flee, likely for... Likely for from being sold into slavery, this woman ended up over the bridge into the Potomac and drowned. The matter would have likely passed in silence, as many did, had not William Lloyd Garrison's early compatriot, Benjamin Lundy, used their paper, The Liberator, to expose it and call for federal action, uh, implicating Key's administration. And the quote is, there is neither mercy nor justice for colored people in this district. That was, that was Lundy. In the Liberator. So, as a result of this, Key was furious with abolitionists for the publicity, issuing threats. Lundy skipped town. In 1836, Key prosecuted a young physician abolitionist named Reuben Crandall for possessing copies of the abolitionist publication The Liberator and the anti slavery reporter in his luggage, which was, of course, against the law in America. Uh, he was a huge stickler, he was, for enforcing these slave codes. Uh, Crandall uh, got tuberculosis in Key's rotten dungeon and ended up dying later. During the trial, Key used th this trial uh, to spout off his racist garbage. And among other gems, here's one. Are you? This is Francis Scott Key, now the author of the National Anthem. Are you willing, gentlemen, to abandon your country, to permit it to be taken from you and occupied by the abolitionist, according to whose taste it is to associate and amalgamate with the Negro. That, ladies and gents, is the author of your national anthem, Francis Scott Key, a genuine Hitler to blacks. And from the third verse, not sung today anymore for some strange reason, this is from the third verse of the national anthem, no refuge could save the hireling and the slave from the terror of flight or the gloom of the grave. And the star-spangled banner in triumph doth wave over the land of the free and the home of the brave. Now get this. If the song means something different today than its putridly racist author intended, that's fine. So I'm all for exercising dominion over history. 
though how much would we want a song written, for example, by Key's brother, Roger Taney? Um, you know, Taney and Key are basically the same person in regard to their views, uh, you know, an oppression of blacks in history. However, the fact that a black football player, the irony that a black football player cannot use the anthem as a stage to cry for justice perpetuated against blacks by the American state today, that is a clear test case, a clear test case that shows that any concept of the anthem as different than intended by its author is a lie. Thank you for joining us in the X-Wing Cave. Until next time, make sure you stay on the right side of that ethical judicial line.